y'all catch the eclipse yesterday, but it was a uh, it was quite a <coughs> quite a scene, <coughs> and uh, it was uh, something truly uh, once in a lifetime you experience. But um, but again, uh, we serve a, a mighty God, and you know we have to at least take a moment just to pause and you know acknowledge that. But you know, April is going to be a much bigger one. Well, looking forward to that one. So yeah. uh, stay tuned. I think it's in April. The, I think the late April. Yeah. But all right, but. Um, that that one will be that one's one. going to be a very interesting one. So um, if you've been following us um, throughout the study, we've been in the book of Hosea. So we've just concluded chapter nine last week, and now we're going into chapter ten. So if you have your Bibles, if you could uh, turn to me here to uh, Hosea chapter ten. And uh, before I begin, like always, I like to always say a quick prayer before we we start. Lord Father, we come to you this morning uh, thanking you for allowing us to gather freely for us to, to study your word. Uh, Lord, in this, this, this time in here, we can just take a moment just to acknowledge you, Lord, and throughout the midst of chaos and through a great, uh, great wonders in your, the cosmos, Lord, we can look to you and just uh, point to you and, uh, and, and tell others how great you are. Uh, Lord, we'd ask that you just allow for us to to learn more about you and uh, for those who are watching that you can bless them this week uh, we thank you for all that you do and all the blessings that you give to us allow your spirit to dwell in this place uh, we ask all these things in your son's precious name amen, amen. so so chapter 10 um, if you've been if you've been reading Hosea it's been you notice it's like a, a continuous pattern going you see how the Israelites, um, how how they've been sinning. Uh, Hosea speaks to them. God uh, punishes, you know, uh, calls out their sin, and you know, again, it's been it's been an ongoing theme uh, throughout the book now. But interesting enough, every chapter has a unique uh, a unique thing tied to it. So, like if we remember in previous chapters, uh, we we talked about the uh, the land, how it suffered. Uh, and the other um, chapters we talked about uh, last week about the, um, um, the 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 figs and the unripe uh, grapes, and so chapter ten always uh, it's it's talking about you know the uh, the sins of Israel, but it always brings something unique, and so um, we're gonna look into that here today. And so if I could get somebody to read for me Hosea chapter ten, uh, verses one through two. Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars, and his land prospered. He adorned his sacred stones. Their heart is deceitful, and now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. Yes, so thank you. Now, I'm curious, what, what do you all have for... Um, for, for verse 1, do you all have, uh, does it say spreading vine? Uh, does it have anything different from your version? Mine is a luxuriant vine that yields fruit. Luxuriant? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, when, when God's talking about the spreading vine, what, what do you know about vines? Um, now, again, remember in these days they were, uh, the Israelites had, uh, they had, were known for their, uh, their figs, their olives, and their grapes, of course, the grapes was used for, of course, wine. And so, what what do you know? I don't know if anybody's a gardener or if anybody's familiar with the way how grapes work. Uh, do you know what happens to uh, a spreading vine? Do you know? Do you know what God's talking about here when He calls Israel a spreading vine? Well, they just go rampant. They go all over the place. Um, if they're not well manicured and trimmed and taken care of. They, they just spread out all over the place. Yes, exactly, because um, what God's talking about here is um, uh, about Israel being like a wild, unkept vine. <laughs> and so you see how the Israelites are acting in a way where it's uh, set apart or uh, where they were, they were called to be set apart, but in this, God is describing them as something, as a rogue vine, something that's just been wild and unkept. Um, 
And go with me here to John chapter 15. Uh, I want to read to you uh, specifically about um, the vine and the branches. So John here, it, Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. And so uh, John chapter 15, uh, and I'll read it for you, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. So, right here, when we talk about in Hosea, how Israel was a spreading vine, it's not a compliment that was given to them. This was something that was, uh, he was describing Israel as a very wild, uh, unkempt vine. And notice here too, uh, in the second, um, the second part of verse 1, he brought forth fruit for himself. So even though a brand, even though a vine can uh, sustain himself, it's, uh, it's wild, it's unkempt, but it's self-sustaining. And that's what God is talking about here with the state of the Israelites. He's talking about uh, a branch that was self-servant, but it, notice it, didn't, it, didn't, it wasn't uh, maintained. It, it wasn't um, pruned. It wasn't, uh, there was no gardener uh, 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 attending that. And so you see uh, this wild, unkept vine of self-servant and self-gratification. Uh, and in the ways that they shows right here in verse 1, it says, it, As his fruits increased, he built more altars. And as his land prospered, he adorned his sacred stones. And so you see here, this is the condition of the Israelites going on. And that's what happens to a lot of people sometimes, is they get comfortable with the the fruit that they're given by God, and they don't need a gardener in their in in talking about the relationship with the vine. Sometimes our fruits can be their blessings. It could be uh, things that we happen to us that may go our way, or that is is abundance. But what, after a while, once we bear fruit, we some some people can develop this you know the self sufficient attitude, as in like oh well. I mean, I have the I have the fruit in my life. I mean, I, I don't need God. I mean, wh why do I need God in this case? Look at me. I, I, my branch is yielding fruit. You know, why would I need something? Why would I need a God to come in? To, to come in? Like, it's like, I'm, we're good. You know, and that's the attitude a lot of people uh, adopt uh, here and today. And so... Uh, With that being said, so we have two grapevines on, on the side of our house. And every year we have to we chop them down, you know, chop them to a very manageable size. But they do they grow wild all over the fence, and we don't do much with them throughout the the growing season. But even when they are bearing fruit, they put on lots and lots of grapes. The birds will come and pick that grape and and pick apart the vine if I'm not you know if I'm not managing the fruit. And taking care of the fruit that's on there, the birds will destroy. It. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like God. I mean, even though we might be showing some fruit, if we're not careful, you know. Yeah, and not, not necessarily that fruit doesn't necessarily mean it's sweet. That's right. So it could it could produce fruit, but it it may taste very sour, and it, so. And that's one of that's definitely one of our bushes is 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 horribly sour. Mm. Brother. Um, this is an online comment. Uh, you have more leaves than grapes. It grows wild. And uh, I think this is very uh, powerful. Just that little statement because when when you're not taking care of and you're not trimming down a grape uh, vine, it'll just continue to grow and you're going to have tons and tons of leaves. So as you're trimming it, it almost forces it to grow grapes. You know what I mean? And if you let it grow wild, all you're getting, like what uh, Brother Kirk was saying, it just, it's just going to go everywhere. So that, that, that trim that you're doing on these grapevines is, gonna, is what's going to allow it to grow grapes. Yeah, and so, fruit. right, and uh, as part of the gardener, it's his responsibility is to maintain the life of that, brand, uh, of that tree. And so um, if it means... Uh, trimming and pruning and uh, sometimes we may not like it maybe we don't uh, we won't like being pruned or chiseled down and trimmed we want to just run freely 
you know, and, and, and us as Americans, we have the privilege of living life, you know, with freedom, with, you know, with liberty, and uh, we take that for granted a lot of times, you know, there's, there's people out in different lands that they suffer oppression, they're, uh, they, they're under um, a government that oppresses them, they live in poverty, and we, we must always remember, we, we have a, a gardener that trims and prunes us. And, and not only that, brother, but <clears throat> like our grapes grow over top of our, our trellis. But if we don't maintain them, they'll just kind of start kind of growing off to the sides. But if you, if you train the limb to go where you want it to go, it will go. Mm-hmm. So just like God can train us and show us the right direction that he wants us to go, it's the same way with the grapevine. I mean, we can have a, a limb that's coming off to the side, but if I wind it in through the, through the trellis the way I want it to go, it'll grow there and it'll continue mm-hmm. on that path. Yeah, and that, uh, that was the, what happened with Israel. You know, it's uh, when God, uh, when they acknowledged God, you know, they were, they were walking with him and they were going, God was leading them in the direction he wanted them to go. But it gets to a point where now they've become like a wild wild vine that it has no gardener and now it's just free to run wherever it goes but again that's that leads to a self-destruction pathway and what what's there to do with there no gardener you have this wild branch growing what what's there to do what what can you do with a wild branch well the only thing you can do is just cut it off it has no purpose now it's you know it it, it produces leaves it yields sour fruit the only thing to, in order to sustain that branch from this wild, unkept vine, is just to cut it off, and so this is what this is what has to happen. And so um, when we see in verse two, their heart is deceitful, and now they must bear their guilt. So it's talking about have God now having to to cut this branch off because the Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. So he's comparing them as you know them being self-sufficient, uh, all of these fruits that they think they're, uh, they're accumulating, it's just going to these altars and to these, uh, these, uh, these pillars just to make their uh, temples more uh, appealing. Brother, I like what you said about the uh, cutting, of, cutting off of the branch. And I think if, if, uh, if we remember so many times in the Bible, it also speaks of not just the branch being cut off, but a branch that is dead and withered. And what is and what does God say in the Bible so many times that he does with that? He burns it. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm so I'm glad you made that connection because we yes. see in Ezekiel how he talks about uh, a dead branch it has no purpose. It's oh. useless. You can't a, a dead branch from a vine is useless because you can't because you may think, well, I mean, we've this at least it's wood. You can at least maybe use it, but th- that type of wood is useless. The only thing that's useless for is fueling for fuel for fire. Mm-hmm. So that's where that's how that's how it's used. Amen. Exactly, fuel for fire. And the thing too, as believers, one thing to remember is that, and it's so true because when we're seeking God's will for our life, and we're seeking and we're praying for God to reveal his will for our life and to guide our steps and we want to live in his will God's hand of protection is over us the minute we start stepping out of God's will to do what we want to do that's when God's hand of protection can be removed and you're going to suffer the consequences you're going to be put into a wilderness for a season because you're not seeking God's will and it's worse for the believer because you know better so God holds you even more accountable. Yeah, and you're you're gonna read here in the next uh, few verses how uh, they're they're gonna be exiled by this uh, invading army here, and so that that's the meaning of verses one through two. And when we're looking at verses three now, kind of going forward into this chapter, it says verse three. Then they will say, "We have no king because we did not revere the Lord. But even if we had a king, what could he do for us?" So again, this is this, um, you see here that this is like this self, um, self-righteous self attitude that these Israelites have. And now notice when it says, because we did not revere God or the Lord, 
it's not talking about like oh we've made our mistake now we we uh we go back and we acknowledge our errors it's talking about it's it's this is more of a rejection statement rather than a uh, um you know a, uh, a sorrowful statement in other words so uh it's talking about we have no king because we did not revere the lord it's talking about a rejection again and i I, I connect I, I see a connection here with you know with the crucifixion whenever Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate it says we have no uh, king but Caesar and so the Jews and the Israelites in this case that's that's been their statements um, with their relationship with uh, with God up to this point prior to them being uh, destroyed but again it's not it always has this repeated cycle where you know the Israelites they they turn away from God and then God brings their judgment and one last chance for God God shows his mercy for him to uh, to acknowledge him but they choose to reject God and it's it's very sad to see you know especially what's uh, uh, their, their ultimately their fate will lead to their destruction but again it's it's it speaks a lot to a lot of um, a lot of people here and you know you you meet you encounter people who you know regardless of how many uh, reasons or um things that you may tell them they're absolutely refused to to acknowledge god and it's i don't know it's just is it just me or is it is it frustrating dealing with those people where you show them the truth you tell them their ways are going to lead to their destruction but they just choose to ignore that and just continue in their own ways i mean it it, it could be it can be very uh, frustrating for for us as believers just having to deal with you know with people like that but um again this is this is the this is a, a, a rejection statement made by uh by the kingdom a northern kingdom uh, to say the least but any comments or questions before i continue i do i want to say something mm -hmm. i i think it can be um like what you're saying you know with the frustration I think it's though also important to remember that you know there's forgiveness, there's mercy, there's grace, right? Mm -hmm. And you know how could we uh, not give someone that when we ourselves, you know, do things that may not edify the Lord all the time, and we have to seek Him for His forgiveness, right? Yeah. And uh, you know how can I go to God and ask for forgiveness if I? can't forgive someone for mm -hmm. doing something that you know is wrong mm -hmm. but uh it's it's a it's definitely a uh opportunity to pray for that person and to try and continue to guide them with truth and with love um and then basically you know giving it to god because mm -hmm. we better try to yeah we we have our limitations as far as what we can do but we just have to continue just to pray for those people you know, and God's given these Israelites countless opportunities for them to make their decision, but they just refuse. They reject God, and so God has no other choice but to you know bring on His His punishment for them. But again, we as um, we as believers, we have you know we only have our limits as far as how much we can forgive others. But ultimately, we just have to leave that to the Lord and have them work you know in in their hearts. And then in, in verse three, there are sour grapes. Yeah, <laughs> we have no king because they do not refer. Uh, we did not refer the uh, the Lord or refer the Lord. But even if we had a king, what can you do for us? They literally just just became completely silent. Yeah, it's 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 almost like they're saying like even if we had a king, like what use is he for us? Because look at us, we have all of these altars, we have these great pillars, we have these fruit, even though it's sour. In their minds, they're thinking, oh, it's fruit. We're self sustaining. We're this wild, unkept vine that's self-sufficient you know look at our glory and so that's the attitude that these israelites had and so uh, so, sounds like the united states right now yeah we're we're very um we're we're treading towards uh this very dangerous uh this path because we we become almost as a way to you know look at us how look how great our nation is but we can never forget where our blessings come from you know it's the it's the true gardener that gives us the fruit, but once we become unwild and unkempt, you know, it's gonna just become sour, and it's gonna just yield no fruit but leaves. And so, uh, we need to always we need to remember, you know, where our true fruit comes from. Uh, verse four, 
it talks about this this is talking about a lot of the, the these attitudes the, the shallowness of these people and so look at verse 4 they make many promises take false oaths and make agreements therefore lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in a, a plowed field so do you know do you ever meet people like you you talk to them like let me ask let me ask the class questions like what how do you gain trust with somebody you know how how do you develop trust with a stranger or with somebody you you've never met what how does that trust develop through a relationship okay <clears throat> now once you develop that relationship you know um it, do you de does trust ja gradually grow from there or is it kind of is it just kind of assumed no it, it's got to grow i mean it's a uh, you you learn how the, the individual uh, reacts to certain situations and and so it's a uh, it's a t it doesn't happen overnight for sure yeah so it's you, it, you you build trust off of a relationship and it, it, it takes time for it to to manifest but also you have to uh, you notice a person's character because um, if they may say something but they don't do it you know that's oftentimes that breaks the trust but whenever these people and notice verse 4 when it says they make many promises and they take false oaths and make agreements Whenever people try to say, I swear by well, on my dear auntie's uh, dead grave that I will fulfill my promise to you. Like, when people have to add promises and oaths, I mean, like, I'm sorry, how, how shallow is your words? Is it really that shallow that you have to attach oaths and promises? You know, and, and this is what, this is, this is how people were. This is how they were acting, and it's... It's the way people are today now i'm sadly to say because you know you meet people who you know they're just not they just can't you can't trust their word it's it has no uh, their words have no meaning it's uh, almost it's fickle and it, they have to add on these things just to make themselves like you know sound like they're trustworthy but to them they're really not and so that's that's been happening too. Like it, and God's seeing this is like, man, how can I trust you when you're not even trustworthy with each other? Because notice in verse four, there are lawsuits that spring up because people know that they can't trust each other. They can't even trust their own neighbor. And how much more can, they, can God trust these people if they can't even be trusted by their own, uh, you know, their own uh, neighbor who you know they're just as sinful as they are, you know, and so. Um, God is just, just looking down and just seeing all of the lies, the deception, and um, in verse four you see like a poisonous weeds in the uh, plowed field. So I always I always kind of connect it with uh, you know the previous verses. So um, unlike the the sour fruit you know that they were bearing, they were also produced. God was pr um, comparing this as a poisonous um, weed, and so. Again, it's um, it, it's indicative of the condition of uh, these people, and so um, they, they bear no fruit. They're wild, unkempt, and rather than produce fruit, they uh, produce poison. And so um, it, it's it's a it's really just a, a crazy um, uh, outcome. But I want to read to you if you could turn to me with to Matthew chapter five. Um, this is the Sermon on the Mount. I wanted to read uh, Matthew five for you. Uh, Matthew 5 verses 33 to 37 connecting to, to verse 4 it 30, said 32 yeah 33, 33. Talk, yeah talking about oh Thank sin yep. so yes Matthew 5 33 we're, we're talking about these oaths the vows, the vows and the promises so <laughs> read, uh, look at what verse uh, Matthew 5 33 says again you have heard that is was said to the people long ago do not break your oath but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. 
Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So this is this is Jesus's words to these people because um, Jesus raised the bar on the Sermon on the Mount, and so uh, he's he was referring to these. He was referring to Hosea, where these they made all of these oaths, these these uh, agreements and promises, but yet um, it, it it had held no meaning. And so Jesus telling them just. Just simply let your yes be yes and your no be no because, you know, how can how can anybody be trustworthy if they have to attach all of these things to their to their vocabulary? And so this is what uh, I love that connection with uh, with Matthew, because oftentimes people, uh, they were so untrustworthy. They were just uh, they would lie and deceive because they were self-sufficient and um, got got fed up with that because. And now it's it, it, he had to bring that to light and connect them with uh, Hosea ten. Amen. You know when you were talking about that, I was thinking about that that parable uh, of the dishonest uh, manager that, mm -hmm. that's in, in Luke, and uh, I just went and turned to that real quickly. And um, Luke sixteen ten, God tells us, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. And I just think that's that's so important to remember as believers, right? Because how can God trust us with big things if he can't trust us with the little things? Mm -hmm. And so it's something to always be mindful of, uh, you know, especially, you know, serving and, and ministries and things like that, leadership. Um, that has been something that, you know, has stuck in my head for mm -hmm. the last probably 15 years, you know, um, and it's so true, and, you know, when you think about it, because I know me in my personal life, um, how can I trust my child with bigger things if there's something that I can't trust them with a small thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and before I bring any um, anything to, you know, to anybody, I have to apply this lesson for myself. I've broken people's trust. I've been dishonest before, but... Um, of course, I, I always have to remember that, you know, we have to be quick to acknowledge our mistake and, you know, just build trust in that person. And so uh, for my own personal testimony, I can I can say that um, I haven't always been trustworthy before. And um, I've gotten in trouble several times because of me being deceitful. But again, I've, I always try to be as honest as I can because that's what God calls us. You know, Jesus instructed us to do that. Not because we think that it makes us feel any better, because God told us to, and so um, I, I just wanted to, you know, to mention that. Brother, it's, I will tell you, if we're all honest with ourselves, we've all been there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all. You know, we all have been there and gone through it at one time or another. But praise God, you know, it's just the realizing of it, and then just correcting it and going forward, mm -hmm. and all is well. Yeah. So. Verse 5 here talks about um, the golden calves here. So look at verse 5. The people who lived in Samaria fear for a gold, a calf idol of Beth Avon. I'm going to pause here. Like, does anybody know what Beth Avon is? Um, if not, that's okay. I mean, it's for those who aren't really familiar. We're back to Hosea, right? Yeah, we're in Hosea. Oh, no, no, it's because we were on Matthew. So we were I, on no, Matthew. I was connecting Matthew with Hosea, right. so that was okay. why I read it. Okay. But we're in, Matt, we're in Hosea. Yeah. Okay. So Beth Avon, um, you know, it, it was known as the house of wickedness. And, you know, I, I it's <coughs> almost like a, uh, it's kind of like a, a contrast with Bethel, which was the house of God. And remember, um, the, the, because the Israelites have become a, a, a wild, unkempt branch, They've become like their own. They've made their own altars. They made their own temples. And for those who are familiar with, you know, the temple in, in uh, ancient uh, in ancient Israel, where was the where was the temple located at? Do you all anybody know? Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where the temple was. But notice that this temple was uh, Samaria was now where was the, the the pagan temple now. And so because they've become self-sufficient, the northern kingdom, because they split from the southern kingdom, because now they've, they've wanted to be set apart from, 
you know, from them. They made their own temple um, location, which was in Samaria. And so it was, um, that was called where it was in Beth Avon. And so um, you talk about a golden idol, a calf idol. And you notice that they people mourn in verse five. Look, pe it, it's people will mourn over it, and they will, uh, it will, so it will. Uh, it's idol uh, adulterous uh, priests, those who had rejoiced over its splendor because it has taken from them into exile. So you see how people have their priorities in the wrong place. Where rather than they're supposed to be in fear and awe of God, now they've placed it over this calf idol instead. And so you see how they were, they had rejoiced in its splendor, uh, they had taken it uh, because they had taken it from exile. What does that remind you of when it says it because it taken them from exile? Exodus, Moses. Go with me to Exodus chapter 32. So we know that, um, that golden calves, um, in this, in, in Hosea, this was to the Canaanite god, uh, El. And, of course, uh, people would make these, um, they would come and worship these idols. So they, these were these golden calves that were in the temple. And so, if anybody has Act, Exodus chapter 32, and, and as a matter of fact, um, I don't think you have to read the whole chapter, but um, I want to at least discuss the main, the main verses. Uh, so... I guess we can read the verse, uh, verses 1 through 5, um, if anybody has Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are, are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, O uh, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a, a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. All right. So not even like they haven't even reached the promised land right after they just left Israel. Uh, and this is whenever Moses goes, he ascends up the mountain. This is where we read the encounter him with the, uh, uh, the, the commandments. But right as soon as Moses leaves, the, the, the people, they, because they came from Egypt, they, only, they went back to what they, they worshipped before, which was the Egyptian gods. And uh, for those who are familiar with uh, Egyptian uh, um, worship, uh, the gold, the, the Egyptian god, uh, the bull god, the Egyptian god was Apis. So it was the Apis bull. And this bull brought, in their beliefs, in the Egyptian beliefs, it was the god of fertility. And so the people, they were so quick to just abandon the mission and uh, go, into, uh, go back to their old ways uh, in worshiping this golden calf. And so it wasn't that very long ago how they just barely left Egypt and now they're going back to the the things that they did and that happens a lot of times as believers where we we become um, we become a uh, new Christians we we come to church we are, are quick to follow God but as soon as the tough gets you know the tough toughness comes and you know the trials and tribulations we just go back to our old ways and so we have to always be careful of not making the same mistake because um, if we start putting idols and golden calves in our lives, then that can all that can leave us astray, and that's exactly what was going on in these in this day, where uh, this reference of the golden calf was, you know, a, a comparison to what was experienced in Exodus, and so these people had uh, this uh, this uh, deception about the spool, and I want to bring to you this point too, because. Um, when people, when they talked about this golden bull, there were, 
we're not really sure what it was, but there are, there are three theories as to who this bull is depicting. It could be either the Egyptian god, the Apis bull. It could either be the Canaanite bull, which was uh, El. Or, and, and these people, believe it or not, they actually built this bull as like a symbol for God. In their minds, they thought that they can fashion God in their own way and making this golden bull. And so in their minds, they're thinking, well, we have our own temple now. Now we will serve God. And now we're going to make this golden idol. And that will be our God. And the God, th this God, that same God. In their minds, that's what they think that they're serving. And, it, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it, it boggles my mind because... You know, how many times do we encounter people where they they form God into their own image? They they make the God, oh, God is a, the feminist God. God is the God, uh, you know, that affirms my uh, my sexuality. The, uh, this God is the God who is, who is all loving and all peace. But these people had no idea about God's true character. And they thought that they could um, form God the same way that they did. Uh, with these other uh, idols and so uh, it, it's no different than what's happening now it's you know people will shape God whoever image they want but yet they don't really acknowledge his true character and so it's it's really just it, it boggles my mind to read how these people think that God could be formed in this some sort of uh, idol and in their minds they think that they're actually worshiping God but there's no evidence for that I mean that's just their own that's their own deception that lies have taken over I love what you said brother I'll share with you, um, it's not, and it's not even just that, but I was just speaking with a loved one recently, and what they were sharing with me is that they felt that the God that that I serve is just the same God as any of the other religions. You know, they were like, it's, it's, I see it as the same God. Everyone, you know, they're, uh, you know, all these churches and uh, denominations are, are, are worshiping the same God, and that was to include Muslim. And so I had to explain in love, of course, that Allah is not the God that I worship. No, I worship the God of Abraham. Okay. And so there was a discussion. But it's so true because when you're not rooted in the Word to learn the character of God and who God Almighty is, <coughs> and there's only one true God, it can be confusing. And unfortunately, there are many that think that way. That it's all the same God, but it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah and uh, it it just goes, um, it, you know, that th these people had no relationship with God, and so they they formed Him in their the only way that they knew, which was, uh, you know, the, the going back to their old ways of living. So that's that's how they formed, you know, this this idol in their minds. They're thinking that's how God truly is, but it, it's not. It comes really. from a lack of knowledge, right? It is, it, and and unfortunately. The lack of knowledge is because there is a a lack of wanting to know. Yes. No because mm -hmm. all they have to do is do a little looking, and they can encounter the real God. But but because of the lack of the willingness and and desire to to do that, they just attach themselves to whatever their own thought process yes. is. And Hosea chapter four verse six. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Amen. And that's so true because I will tell you, as believers, we don't have the liberty to live saying, well, I think. It's not what we think. That's it's right. what Amen. the Lord thinks. Amen. Amen. We have to look at the Bible. What does the Bible say about it? Right? And I think whenever we approach situations in life, that's a good way to approach that situation. It's not how... I think I should approach it, but what does God say? What does the Bible say on how I should approach it? Yeah, well, the Bible reads us, not we amen. read the Bible. So, amen. 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 Brother, can I make a, a point um, real quick? Because earlier you were saying how they were, they wanted to put an image to God as their way. I think a really good way of explaining it in modern day is a church building. We don't just pray here at church. This is just where we come together to fellowship, to be amongst believers. But we are to pray at home, too. We are to, um, you know, be serving him every day of our lives, wherever we're at. And so a lot of the times, if you're not educated and you're just, you know, 
coming into this building and you think that prayer only works if you're inside this building, that can become an idol itself. Mm-hmm. So, Amen. I don't know if it's yes. something that came to mind. Amen. No, you're right. And so, so what will happen to these people now that God's seen this, this golden idol? So, well, we see in verse 6, it will be carried uh, to, uh, to Assyria as tribute to the great king. Verse 7, Ephraim will be, oh, I'm sorry, verse 6, Ephraim will be disgraced. Israel will be ashamed of its wooden idols. And so it's talking about, you know, um, this, this, this invasion army um, about to come and to, to take um, Israel um, captive. And so they, this calf will be removed um, as a result of, you know, uh, God <coughs> sending this army to go and to remove this idol. And so we read in verse 7, Samaria and its king will float away like a twig on the surface of the waters. You know, and uh, I don't know, I just, it, when I read verse 7, it, it made me think of the, you know, of the great floods of Noah, how uh, the, the land has been cleansed by this, this water, and how the, the kings, these wicked kings and the, the people in this wicked town or of Samaria uh, have been, um, uh, have, will float away and they will be cleansed from the land. And so I, I found, a, I saw a connection there uh, when I read verse 7 about, you know, the wickedness. And, of course, um, if we read what happens with, you know, the northern kingdom, um, again, this is almost spelling their destruction uh, because we we, re- we read later that the Assyrian army did go in and uh, they uh, they cleansed the, the land. They're, now that the northern kingdom no longer exists, but, again, this was their own, own doing that, you know, God had finally punished them. And so God destroys the king. He destroys Samaria. Verse 8 says that uh, the high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. And again, the, referring to this sin of Israel, this, this golden calf was their sin. This was, the, this was the biggest sin that kept them from having a relationship with God. And it, the only thing to do from what can you do with the wild branches but just cut it off. And so that's what's happening with them. And so, um, again, it says, verse 8, Thorn and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills fall on us. And so the people go hiding. You know, they're now they're fleeing to the mountains and the hills because they their notion of worship was uh, of the, these, uh, these idols, these calves. And thorn and thistles, where does that, how does that connect anywhere? Well, Genesis 3, whenever, you know, Adam uh, and Eve, it says, Cursed is the ground, for it will produce thorns and thistles. And so, again, it's a, it, it, it really relates to a lot of uh, what's going on. You know, it's, um, we need to be very careful as believers because, you know, we can oftentimes be an example. Uh, this is an example of what happens when we don't follow uh, God, but always just stay firm in your faith. Just read, uh, let the Bible read you and um, let God's word soak into your heart and just keep his, his word um, abundant in your life. And so, uh, again, there's a lot to go over in Hosea. I, hopefully I kind of explained as far as the situation going on, but um, I hope you all enjoy the lesson today. Uh, we're going to be continuing on in uh, verse uh, verses 9 through 15, so um, you want to stay tuned for that. But... Uh, other than that, I think that pretty much concludes the study. Uh, but any final comments or questions before I close? Mm-hmm. Are you excited? Mm-hmm. I'm curious if we have idols in our lives today. We do. Like, like TV, mm-hmm. etc. Yeah. Yes. Well, any anything that is, replaces God becomes an idol. So we we know it's just to remember just to uh, <coughs> to, to worship God and to uh, keep any idols away from our lives. But mm-hmm. Or a, or a reliance too, brother. It's um, like these people re- had to rely on an idol because they they so that they could physically see it, right? Just like in Exodus, they wanted to see God, and what happened? Like they may you will surely die, right? Um, and that's why the these calves, these golden idols, these golden bowls, are in many people's lives today because they always uh, what you hear today is. Well, well, why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God do this? Then let me see God. Why doesn't God reveal himself, right? 
just like they did back in the days and back in you know, ancient Near East, that's what we see today. Little do they know that um, we, will, we will surely die. Like, like, you can't have sin presented before God. Like, it, like it's completely impossible. And when, when, uh, um, and even then, when they get to a point where, I know we're running out of time. No, you're fine. Yeah. When we get to a point where in our lives, when we say, well, you know, God reveal yourself to me. If you're really true, really reveal yourself to me. Then you start going into that verse you mentioned earlier, um, uh, verse 3. Uh, but even if you had a king, what can you do for us? There's no satisfaction. There's, there's no complete satisfaction mm-hmm. when people reject God or they try to prove that God doesn't exist or um, or because they, uh, in their hearts, they want to worship these idols mm-hmm. to cover themselves, to cover their sin, to, to make themselves feel comfortable. That's, that's where our faith that's needs where to come in right because, now. you know, people always want to attach uh, something tangible to God, but yeah. uh, that our faith needs to take precedent and uh, just... We always have to just let that um, be priority in that life. But, uh, but again, thank you all for the comments, and you know, it was a great, great study. I hope this blesses us all. Lord, let's go to the Lord. Lord Father, we come to you this morning, uh, thanking you for allowing us to, to study your word, Lord. And always let us remember, Lord, to uh, to always to, to 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 go to you, Lord. To no idols or no nothing um, in our lives should take precedent over you, Lord. Let us always remember these words and to always just to hear to you and for uh, for you to uh, allow for us to come into you and for us to worship you. Lord, let us always um, come with an open heart and for us to, to to learn more about you. We thank you for the study. We thank you for your, your gift, great gift on the cross. Uh, we thank you for all that you do in our lives. In your son's name we ask. Amen.